Mark Rothko will be born in Russia and move to the United States at the age of 10. He will begin as a figurative artist, but soon began to believe that references to anything in the physical world conflicted with the sublime idea of the universal. And this is an idea that we've heard in the past. He will focus on color to convey a sense of meaning. And so he's very similar to ideas that we've seen from Kandinsky looking for that idea of the universal, as well as ideas that we saw from De Stiel, from Mandrain. And so he's following a similar path. The idea is the universal will come to us if we eliminate any kind of cultural reference, any reference that someone from another society or another culture wouldn't actually understand. And his focus will be color. Primarily, the emotional resonance that color inherently holds. Now, we've touched on that, and Rothko is, in fact, a color field painter. So, we're on the other half of abstract expressionism, looking at color field as opposed to looking at gestural abstraction. Now, when you look at a Rothko such as this, and this is at the Rothko Chapel down in Texas, you're going to be faced with a large panel of color, sometimes a solid color, sometimes more of a glazed color where there's some modeling to it, sometimes multiple colors. But what you do, once again, is sit in front of it. The difference is, whereas Pollock gives you shapes for your mind to deal with, and so your mind kind of plays in that realm of what do I see. With Rothko, you lose some of that. And what you run into is a sense of almost sensory deprivation. We don't like that. I mean, think about when you're sitting down doing homework, when you're sitting down doing something at home, frequently we need to have music on or a YouTube video or headphones or something. And yet Rothko gives us something very different. In this case, at the Rothko Chapel, these sort of violet black panels. And as you look at them, you're left with nothing but your own thoughts. Because it's a silent room, so you're not hearing anything. There's really nothing to see apart from that singular color. There's nothing to touch because, of course, you're sitting on your own, uh, or at least you're in a public space. In general, we don't touch things in public spaces, especially in the age of COVID. We don't taste art. Please don't taste art. That would be weird. And we don't generally smell anything. And so what you have is sensory deprivation. And so whatever's in your mind going in is going to become bigger. This is why people will have emotional breakdowns in front of Rothko's. You will have situations with Rothko and Kelly and some of the other color field artists where people will actually break out in tears looking at it. And it's not the painting doing it. The painting is simply giving you a mirror and removing all other distractions so that you are stuck with the things in your head. And for many people, that's kind of disconcerting. Now, the piece we're looking at is his number 14, 1960. Again, another number-based system. He's numbering these pieces, again, based on year. And I should warn you, if you ever research Rothko, make sure you are confirming that the number 14, 1960 that you're looking at is the one that you're thinking of. You always need a visual reference with Rothko because sometimes the numbers get mixed up, the years get mixed up. So just something to keep in mind. So as we look at this piece, he sought, Rothko sought to create a visual experience through the use of large planes of color. Here we see fuzzy color blocks that seem to float suspended in front of the canvas. Now, as we look at it, if we start to tear it apart a little bit, let's start with that background color. I have to point out, no one actually knows what it is. Scholars argue about this all the time. Is it violet? Is it gray? Is it brown? Is it red? Is it chartreuse? Okay, I might be making up the last one. But we're not really sure. It is a subdued tone. It's obviously not something we're supposed to focus on. And then we have sort of an orange-red at the top and a blue underneath. And what he's doing is he's using a glaze technique. So he's taking his paint, he's mixing it with varnish or with paint thinner to thin it out. 
And then he's applying the paint in thin glazes, which is why you get this modeled effect. So areas are thicker, other areas are a little bit thinner, and he's leaving it there intentionally. We know that he, you know, we can read his brush strokes, we can read his movements, very similar to ideas of gestural abstraction. Same thing in the blue, whereas the background frequently is a almost solid color. Uh, it's always modeled to some degree, but not nearly as much as the larger fields that we see here. And you should keep in mind that the color relationship was meant to be decorative. He did not intend it to be read into. So again, we have this work that relies on formal elements. But before we get there, let's talk about interpretation. So you're standing in front of this Rothko. Now, depending on the mood that you're in, when you're standing in front of it, you may focus on the orange. For example, if you're in a good mood or you're feeling energetic or you're feeling happy, uh, maybe even if you're feeling angry, you might see this as more of a red. Whereas if you're feeling more depressed, more down or very calm, you might focus on the blue and that will change day to day. So again, your mood plays a huge role with these pieces when we look at abstract expressionism. Now, some of you might actually focus on the background color, and that's kind of this emotional wild card. You could focus on that no matter what you're feeling. And as you look at that, you're going to probably focus on one of those colors, and it's going to bring out those ideas. As you stand in front of it for three to five minutes, your train of thought is going to go internal more than external. And that's where you start seeing those strong emotional responses to many of the paintings done by Rothko. Now, this is not to say that he's doing this without looking at good formal compositional ideas. So what we have is a work that relies on the formal elements of design, of composition, to evoke an emotional response. So what we have is formal principles being used without illustration. So he's using ideas of composition, ideas of line, ideas of shape and form, space, value, color, texture, all in this piece. They're all present, even though we're not looking at something that is attempting to illustrate the real world. And so that makes this that much stronger. He has such a good understanding of what makes good art that he can break those rules. He can remove that framework using the principles without using the ideas of illustration to create a powerful piece that draws out a strong emotional response from many of the people who view it.